He moved all the way across the country to Seattle to found a company back in 1994 by the name of Amazon. He's also the founder of Blue Origin, a human spaceflight startup company. Hey Dev Nation, it's Ryan. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at Jeff Bezos and his keys to success. If you cannot, if you can't afford to be misunderstood, then for goodness sake, don't do anything new or innovative. He, he, he created the illusion for me when I was four years old that I was helping him on the ranch, which of course could not have been true, <laughs> but I believed it. And, um, and then as, by the time I was 16, of course, I was actually helping on the ranch. I, you know, I, could, I can fix prolapsed cattle. I can, you know, we did all of our own veterinary work. Some of the cattle even survived. Um, <laughs> and uh, we fixed windmills and laid you know, water pipelines and built fences and barns and fixed, that, fixed the bulldozer that you guys talked about. And so one of the things that's so interesting about that lifestyle and about my grandfather is he did everything himself. You know, he didn't call a vet if one of the animals was sick. He figured out what to do himself. And uh, so, what does it mean? No delegation. Being resourceful, I think, mm -hmm. is the you know that you can always you can't if there's a problem, there's a solution. Mm -hmm. And of course, as you as you mature and and get into the business world and anything you do on a team, you very quickly realize that it's not about just your own resourcefulness. It's about mm. team resourcefulness and how does that work and um, various crises. In 2002, oh, you went many. almost uh, bankrupt. So well, what I, went wrong and what I, did you learn we, from that? We had so many. There have been so many. Um, we haven't had any existential crises. Knock on wood. I find I don't want to jinx anything. Um, but we've had a lot of uh, kind of dramatic events. I remember um, there, early on, we only had 125 employees when Barnes & Noble, who, the big U United States bookseller, um, opened their online website to compete against us, barnesandnoble.com. We'd had about a two-year window. We opened in 95. They opened in 97. And at that time, all of the headlines, and the funniest were about how we were about to be destroyed by this much larger company. We had 125 employees and $60 million a year in annual sales, 60 million with an M. And that, uh, and Barnes and Noble at the time had 30,000 employees and about $3 billion in sales. So it, they were giant, we were tiny, and we had limited resources. And the, the headlines were um, very negative about Amazon. And the, the one that's most memor memorable was just Amazon.toast. And, um, <laughs> and so I called an all hands meeting, which was not hard to do with just 125 people. And we got in a room, and because it was so um, scary for all of us, this idea that now we finally had a big competitor that literally everybody's parents were calling and saying, you know, are you okay? Is the, you know, it's usually the moms um, calling and asking their children, are you gonna be okay? So, and I said, look, you know, it, it's okay to be afraid, um, but don't be afraid of our competitors because they're never gonna send us any money. Be afraid of our customers. And if we just stay focused on them and, 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 and instead of obsessing over this big competitor that we just got, that we'll be fine. Um, and I really do believe that. I think that if you stay focused, then the more uh, drama there is and everything else, no matter what the drama is, whatever the external distraction is, the, the, what your, your response to it should be to double down on the customer, satisfying them, not just satisfying them, delighting them. Yeah. This work-life harmony thing is what I try to teach young employees, actually and senior executives at Amazon too, but especially the people come in, I get, we're asked about work-life balance mm -hmm. all the time. And my view is that's a debilitating phrase because it, um, it implies there's a strict trade-off. And the reality is if I'm happy at home, I come into the office with tremendous energy. And if I'm happy at work, I come home with tremendous energy. And so it actually is a circle, it's not a balance. And, um, and I think that that is, uh, is worth everybody paying attention to. You, want to have your, you never want to be that guy, and we all know, we all have a coworker who is that person who as soon as they come into the meeting, they drain all of the energy out of the room. Mm. You can just feel the energy level go, that you don't want to be that guy. So you want to come into the office and 
give everybody a kick in their step. You, on, with your loved ones, you, you, you bet on them. You're not betting on the idea. You're, you're, you, you are betting on the person. And that was, uh, that, and it's one of those decisions I made with my heart and not my head. And I basically said, I don't want to regret, I don't, when I'm 80, now 90, I, have, I want to have minimized the number of regrets that I have in my life. And most of our regrets are acts of omission. They're things we didn't try. It's the path untraveled. Um, those are the things that haunt us. Now that you have about 600,000 employees, I calculate that you're adding about 250 people a day. Um, you've mentioned that you're trying to fend off day two. Yeah. And you've said that day two is stasis, followed by irrelevance, followed by excruciatingly painful decline, followed by death. That yeah. is why it is always day one. Yeah. I, so I, yeah. How's that work? Well, so day one, um, this is a phrase that we use at Amazon all the time. I've been using it since my first annual shareholder letter from 20 years ago. Um, and we say it's always day one. And it needs to be day one for the reason that you just mentioned. Um, and how do you, so the real question for me is how do you go about maintaining a day one culture? You know, it's great to have the, um, the scale of Amazon. We have financial resources. We have lots of brilliant people. We can accomplish great things. We have global scopes. We have operations all over the world. But the downside of that is that you can lose your nimbleness. You can lose your entrepreneurial spirit. You can lose your, that kind of heart that, the, the, that, um, that small companies often have. And so if you could have the best of both worlds, if you can have that entrepreneurial spirit and heart, while at the same time having all the advantages that come with scale and scope, think, think of the things that you could do. And, and so how, the question is, how do you achieve that? Um, the, the scale is good because it makes you robust. You know, a, a, a big boxer can take a punch to the head. The question is, you also want to dodge those punches. So you'd like to be nimble. You want to be big and nimble. And I find that there are a lot of things that are protective of the day one mentality. I already spent some time on one of them, which is customer obsession. I think that's the most important thing. If you can, and it gets harder as you get bigger. When you're a little tiny company, say you're a 10 person startup company, every single person in the company is focused on the customer. When you get to be a bigger company, you've got all the middle, you've got middle managers and you've got all these layers and the, those people aren't on the front lines. They're not interacting with customers every day. They're insulated from customers, and they start to manage not the customer uh, happiness directly, but they start to manage through proxies like metrics and processes, and some of those things can become bureaucratic. So it's very challenging. But one of the things that happens is the decision-making velocity slows down. And I think the reason, one of the reasons that that happens is that people, all say junior executives inside the big company start to uh, model all decisions as if they are heavyweight, irreversible, highly consequential decisions. And so even two-way doors, you could make, you make a decision, it's the wrong decision, you can just back up, back through the door and try again. Even those reversible decisions start to be made with heavyweight processes. And so you can teach people that these pitfalls and, and, and traps, and then teach them to avoid those traps. And that's what we're trying to do at Amazon so that we can maintain our inventiveness and our heart and our kind of small company spirit, even as we have the scale and scope of a larger company. So six, uh, still have the two pizza rule and no PowerPoints? Oh yeah, the two pizza team, we try to, we try to uh, um, create teams that are no larger than can be fed with two pizzas. We call that the two pizza team rule. Um, no PowerPoints are used inside of Amazon. Uh, so every meeting, we have the, when we hire a new executive from the outside, <laughs> this is the weirdest meeting culture you will ever encounter. And new executives have a little bit of, you know, culture shock in their first Amazon meeting because what we do is somebody for the meeting has prepared a six page memo, a narratively structured memo that is got, you know, real sentences and topic sentences and verbs and nouns, not just bullet points. And it lays out and supposed to create the context for what will then be a good discussion. So 
and then we read those memos silently in the meeting. So it's like a study hall. And we do that, everybody sits around the table, and we read silently for usually about half an hour, however long it takes us to read the document. And then we discuss it. And it's so much better than the typical PowerPoint presentation for so many reasons. I could talk about this for all of so our nobody time. Eats if you're going to do anything new or innovative, you have to be willing to be misunderstood. And if you can't tolerate that, then for God's sake, don't do anything new or innovative. Um, every important thing we've done has been misunderstood, um, so often by well-meaning, sincere critics, sometimes, of course, by self-interested, uh, insincere critics. But, but, you know, I'll give you an example. A thousand years ago, we started this thing called customer reviews, and we let customers review books. We only sold books at that time. And customers could come in and rate a book between one and five stars, and they could write a text-based review. You guys are very familiar with this. It's now a very normal thing. But back then, this was crazy. And the, uh, the publishers, the book publishers, did not like this. Because, of course, not all the reviews are positive. And the, uh, I got a letter from one publisher that said, I have a good idea for you. Why don't you just publish the positive customer <laughs> reviews? And I thought about this, and, cause, and he, his, the argument he was making to me is that our sales would go up if we just published the positive customer reviews. And I thought about this, and I thought, I don't, I don't actually believe that, because I don't think we make money when we uh, sell something, we make money when we help someone make a purchase decision. And it's just a slightly different way of looking at it, because people are, the part of what they're paying us for is helping them make a purchase decision. And if you think about it that way, then you want the negative reviews too. And of course, it has been extremely helpful for people to have negative customer reviews. And by the way, it's come full circle now, where the product manufacturers use the customer reviews to improve the next generation of the product. So it's actually helping the whole ecosystem. But and now nobody criticizes customer reviews. And in fact, if you were to in the, in, you know, here in the year 2018, if some e-commerce company were to say, we're only gonna publish the positive customer reviews, that would be the crazy thing that would get criticized. So the new and innovative quickly becomes um, the new normal, and then it's, you know, it's, 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 it's the new incumbent idea, and then it doesn't get uh, criticized. When, by the way, more generally, and what I preach at Amazon to all of our employees is when we are criticized, there is a simple uh, process that you need to go through, which is first you look yourself in the mirror and decide, is your critic right? Do you agree? Are we doing something wrong? If you are, change. And by the way, if you look yourself in the mirror and you decide that your critic is wrong, as we did with the customer reviews, then do not change, no matter how much pressure is brought to bear. Do the right thing in that case as well. Um, have a deep keel. You have to have a deep keel. So first of all, you don't choose your passions. Your passions choose you. And all of us are gifted with certain passions and the people who are lucky are the ones who get to follow those things. And I always advise our uh, young employees, I meet with interns and so on, you can have, and my kids too, you can have a job, or you can have a career, or you can have a calling. And if you can somehow figure out how to have a calling, you have hit the jackpot, because that's the big deal. And uh, most people don't ever get there. You know, you're very lucky if you have a career. A lot of people end up with a job. And so, um, you know, for me, I have been interested in rockets, space travel, propulsion, since I was a five-year-old boy. And I have spent a tremendous amount of time thinking about it. So it's not like I really have a choice to follow this passion. It has captured me.
Hope you guys enjoyed today's Role Model Monday video, taking a look at Jeff Bezos' keys to success. If you enjoyed today's video, please make sure to hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe down below. Remember to persevere and continue towards your goals. I'm wishing you guys all the best. Thanks for watching.